Hey guys, welcome to AMCI Indie Spotlight. This is the show which celebrates indie movies and lets you know what to see at the cinema. I'm Alicia Malone and today I'm joined by two beardo weirdos. First up from AMC and Think Hero, David Griffin, a.k.a. Gryffindor. Griffin, I, I've never been called Gryffindor before, <laughs> okay. but that is awesome. And I'm also a Beardo Weirdo. I'm getting all kind of new names <laughs> to use in my introductions. Thank you, Alicia. This is already shaping to be a great day. Yeah, I love giving people <laughs> nicknames. So next to him we have from Slash Film, Rusty Rush, Fi- Rush Fisher. Oh, I screwed it. Rusty Rush Fisher. <laughs> Rusty, never. Rusty. Never, never, never. never. I like no, it. No, it's not happening. Rusty Rust. roll this back right now. God, get No, damn it. I used to fight kids if you called me Rusty. <laughs> like, that was a, I don't know if it was a vacation or what, but I was like, Rusty was always that one where it's like, oh, no, it's not Come happening. Come here, I'll take you. Tamar, call, Tamar Rusty. from Paramount calls me Rusty, and she's like the only one that gets away with it for some reason. Okay, I'll, I'll come up with a new one. Maybe maybe you, you can you know see if you can make work for Mr. You. Fisher. It's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get into a bit of indie movie news. And Ewan McGregor has said he would be on board for Trainspotting 2 if it ends up happening. Back in 1996, Trainspotting was the breakout little indie movie for McGregor, the second movie he made with director Danny Boyle. They went on to make A Life Less Ordinary together, but had a falling out after Leonardo DiCaprio was cast as the lead in The Beach. Now they've made up and Ewan says, there was some bad blood and ill feeling, but it's all gone now. I think it might be extraordinary to see a sequel 20 years after the original. So Russ, Mr. Yes. Fisher, would you like to <laughs> see Trainspotting 2 20 years later? Eh, I guess. Yeah, you know, I mean... I love Train Spotting. I do. I think Train Spotting was one of the key movies in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I was so into that movie when it was out. I'm still so into it. I really dig it. Um, I'm l- less enamored of what Danny Boyle is doing now. Uh, I'm not, I, I, will, I will watch the movie. You know, I think the idea is interesting. I think the idea of kind of taking the same cast, going back, and, you know, Boyle has said for years that he wanted to do another one, that he wanted to do, uh, you know, another Irvine Welsh story and kind of go back and and follow these characters again. But I think the story is supposed to take place 10 years later, but yeah. he wanted the actors to be significantly more aged so that the, it would look like those 10 years had really worn on them really hard. Um, I'm going to watch it. I Of course I'm going to watch it. Am I super excited? Eh, eh, did eh. you like Trance or no? I, no, 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 I don't like trance. I want to, I really do. Like I want to like all of Danny Boyle's stuff. And it's been probably like Sunshine was maybe the last one that I was really totally into. Mm -hmm. Um, They're always, there's stuff I like, but yeah, trance, trance I have kind of an argumentative relationship with. (laughs) Yeah, well, David, he's got a great visual style. Mm -hmm. Are you a Danny Boyle fan? Yes, especially Sunshine is one of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time. I I, I fell in love with that movie, even the last 20 minutes, which I know some people don't really like. It goes Mm -hmm. a little bit horror, but I still really enjoy it. I don't know, like I said, I agree. I don't know if I'm super excited about seeing a train spotting too, but I would like to see it. What interests me is this beef between them. Yeah. Like over beach. Well, it's like but, really, I mean, is he more jealous of Leo, or is he upset that he just? Disca- I mean, I just don't understand. Okay. Like that didn't like launch Leo's career. Like it wasn't going to be like a. Uh, can you explain? Well, maybe? Uh, yeah, and so one thing that I was told years ago mm-hmm. was, and and I I believe this to be true, is that the part of the uh, enmity between the two came out as a result of like uh, Ewan McGregor and Danny Boyle and. Uh, uh, was it uh, Gar? I can't remember the writer. Um, had developed the beach together, and the whole idea was we're going to do this. And the beach is very much like a UK, ba- you know, it's about UK travel culture. It's about these kids mm-hmm. in Britain. I love the kind book. Of, the book is yeah, fantastic. Um, you know, it's very much about British kids, right? And it was a thing that Ewan was going to do with Danny, and there was going to be this whole thing. And then there was studio leverage that caused Leo to be cast. And of course, the idea of ca- casting DiCaprio, an American right. kid, in this very British story was A, so that's problem number one, but B, the thing that I was told is that Ewan McGregor found out that he had been uh, passed over for the role by reading it in like the sun on his way to the lunch with Danny Boyle, where Danny Boyle was going to say, Hey, we had to go with Leo DiCaprio. Uh, So like he found out about it in the worst way possible. uh, Um, And you know, this, this is a story that I was told by someone who was in train spotting and who knows, all of wow. that stuff years ago. So I do put some credit behind that story, mm-hmm. uh, but I think that, that that's kind of the, you know, that's the root of the thing mm-hmm. is, is that there was this really tight association with Ewan McGregor and Danny Boyle and that it was kind of 
yanked out from under him. And my belief is that he, that Ewan McGregor saw it as a betrayal because Danny Boyle didn't like fight for him. You know, because yeah. yeah, Ewan's always one of those great actors. I, I wish he'd get more work. He's kind of maybe not in the same pedigree, but almost like a Guy Pierce. Where when you see him, you appreciate what he's doing. He does good work, but he kind of just floats around. Mm -hmm. You know, he's never attached to anything for too long, except for of course <laughs> the prequels. But mm -hmm. even in then, he was good. He was great in the prequels. He's a great actor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to see him come back to this role. Train spotting, I loved. I had this poster, so many of my friends. It was kind yeah. of one of the seminal movies when I was growing <laughs> up. Yeah. So I'm fascinated to hear what these characters are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll have to set it 20 years later because I know there's the Irvine Welsh book, Porno, which right. came out and it's set nine years after the first. And I think that was supposed to be what the, what the root of the material for this quote unquote sequel was going to be. Which I haven't read that book, so Nor I'm not sure what the material is, but yeah, I'd like to see it. And I didn't actually know much about this beef with him and Danny Boyle. I, mm. I only just realized when I was reading the story, I was like, oh yeah, he hasn't been in a Danny Boyle movie for a long time. Yeah. I remember loving Life Less Ordinary as well. So yeah. for those two to get back together mm -hmm. would be fantastic. All yeah. right, next up, <laughs> uh, the first trailer for the documentary, He Named Me, Malala has been released. And this doc is directed by David Guggenheim, who is behind An Inconvenient Truth and focuses on the amazing Malala Yus Yousafzai. Oh, I practiced that too. <laughs> Yousafzai, the youngest Nobel Peace Prize laureate. <laughs> David, what did you think about this first trailer? Sorry about it's that. A, no, no, it's like, those are tough names. Uh, it's a beautiful trailer. Uh, it's one of those trailers that just pulls you in emotionally. I mean, you can't help but get a little bit, you know, tugged at the heartstrings there. I mean, it's a beautiful story. I love that in the trailer, the father named his daughter after a martyr, mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. that she was going to be different, wanting her daughter to be different. I love that he talks about how. No, she says that, like, you know, if I was born in a normal family, if I had a normal mother and father, then I would have two kids by now. But I'm not. I'm here in the States. Mm -hmm. I'm meeting new people. I'm struggling in physics class. I don't know how to take these classes. But she's just doing what she wants to do, which is give women the right to learn around the, the world, which we, of course, here take for granted. So I, I, I'm definitely down for this trailer. I want to see this mm -hmm. film. Yeah, yeah, Russ, it's yeah. interesting to see her in her everyday life. There was yeah. a part in the trailer I really liked where she's giggling over Rod, Roger Federer. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. this looks like a nice way he to show nice more about yeah. it. He <laughs> has nice hair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I don't see how you can fail to be moved by this trailer. And I think that it's incredibly inspiring to see someone who, in an age where I was <laughs> not at all capable of doing anything like what she's achieved, that someone is so, you know, self-possessed and that someone is so aware of what they're doing and is so uh, worldly and mindful and, and dedicated to an ideal. And I, I think it's it's really wonderful to see. You know, yeah, you I, see her speak on news programs and she's just mm -hmm. so composed and seems yeah. a lot older than she actually is. But then when you see these nice little moments behind the scenes, it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, she is just a regular girl yeah. with two brothers and it's kind of sad when she talks about wanting to go back home mm -hmm. and it sounds like she can't go back mm -hmm. home. And, so. and seeing that footage of her as a quote-unquote regular kid is – I think something that makes her all the more remarkable as a person because yeah. it's easy to see someone who is very young and who is, uh, you know, a Nobel laureate and is achieving these things is very outspoken and it's easy to think of them as some sort of elevated super person or something like that. Yeah. So then you see this footage that grounds them and that puts them in an everyday existence that is very much like what we all know and it's like, oh no, sometimes it just takes that mm -hmm. that determination and that spark and she clearly has it and it, it looks like a wonderful story. I like how she She's longing, like you said, longing for home. She says, I miss the smelly streets. Yeah. You know, we also give her like, oh, come to America. You know, it's a dream. <laughs> Everything will be great. She's like, no, actually, I want to go back home. I miss yeah. home. I miss Where I miss she's my from. Family. Yeah. And I didn't realize the story about her name either. Yeah. So this trailer taught me a lot and the movie is out in October. So I yeah. can't wait to see the full thing. <laughs> yeah. Another trailer which was released this week is for the Stanford Prison Experiment. Now this movie played at the Sundance Film Festival, stars Billy Crudup and Ezra Miller. And this is based on a fascinating true story. In 1971, Stanford conducted a psychological experiment on 24 students, dividing them into two groups, guards and prisoners. The experiment had disturbing results and ended after just six days days. Russ, there's already been a documentary about this experiment, but do you think this true story makes for the perfectional, perfect like fictional movie for people who don't know about it? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, it's a very arresting story, right? The idea that what we conceive of as our social boundaries and our social roles can so quickly be redefined when you're put into a new context. And I think for me, that's a very fascinating thing. The original story of this experiment has been a thing that's been fascinating for 
years, you know, it seems like a thing that th uh, for most of my life has been a story that keeps coming up. You keep hearing about it. Mm -hmm. I think because it is so, uh, so affecting. I look at this footage and I, on one hand, I like it. On the other hand, I worry about it kind of over exaggerating something that is pretty intense to begin with. So that's my, that, that's my, my uh, wariness coming into play with this. But I love the cast and it, and it is a really intriguing uh, presentation of human behavior. Yeah, David, it's out in July. Are you mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing I it? I am. I, I never even heard of this project. I, I did a little research. I went, you know, all, went on Wikipedia anyway. <laughs> yeah. I did a little bit of yeah. research. I went and, and looked up this whole study. It's really interesting how they actually did this. And of course, like you know, like you're saying, the cast is great. I mean, Billy Crudup is is always fantastic, and uh, it looks like it's going to be like it looks very tense. Mm. Like it's going to be a very tense movie, and it's just crazy how I mean, I think well, not in a good way. I think prison's fascinating. How mm. how horrible it can be, and how they can break people down, and actually have these college kids who are going to a very very prestigious school thrown in this environment and they crack mm. and they crumble and they fall apart. And they've got kids like, let me out, let me out and all this stuff. It looks very haunting. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely want to see this in July. Yeah. It had pretty mm -hmm. good reviews at Sundance. Some people saying that maybe mm. it's, it's a little bit messy towards mm -hmm. the end, like mm -hmm. the experiment itself, mm -hmm. but I really want to see it because of the cast. Such mm -hmm. a great cast. Ty Sheridan is in there as well. Who's always fantastic. I'm sorry. I just said Ezra. I mean, we want to see what the flash is going to do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Ezra Miller's great in general. Like yeah. I watch anything. Mm -hmm. Like we need to talk yeah. about Kevin. He's so oh chilling God. and then he's completely different mm -hmm. in Perks of uh, being Warflower. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think he's really fascinating actor. Mm -hmm. I want to see the documentary. This mm -hmm. is, you know, about the real project mm -hmm. because it's so fascinating how you can know something isn't real but you can really get into it. Mm -hmm. Like recently I got to do the Oculus Rift oh, yeah. uh, for The Walk, the oh, movie no. that's coming out later this year mm -hmm. with Robert Zemeckis. And mm -hmm. when you put it on... It shows that you're at the top of the Twin Towers with a tight rope ahead of you. And even though I knew I'm standing on the floor, <laughs> I'm not going to fall, I lasted 30 seconds. I was like, I can't do this. I couldn't take a step. I was like, I can't get it off. And so I just find anything fascinating to do with psychology and how you can trick your brain into believing something. Mm -hmm. It seems like that's what, <laughs> what happened here when mm -hmm. they actually took on the roles as guards and prisoners. And there's a role, uh, there's a line in the trailer where Ezra's character says, "Like we're we're here forever, mm. we're stuck here forever." Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's just amazing. Six days, yeah. six days of hell. All right, well, let's get into what you can watch in theaters this week. Big Game <laughs> is an action film starring Samuel L. Mother Loving Jackson. He plays the president of the United States who teams up with a Finnish teenager after the Air Force One crashes in some Finland woods. It looks so funny. Faith of Our Fathers, about two sons of Vietnam vets who meet up for the first time before they travel to the War Memorial in Washington. Infinitely Polar Bear is a drama starring two Marvel favorites, Zoe Saldana and Mark Ruffalo. He plays a father with bipolar who takes over responsibility for his two daughters. Into the Grizzly Maze sees James Marsden and Thomas Jane in an action thriller where they play estranged brothers being stalked by a bloodthirsty grizzly bear in the Alaskan wilderness. <laughs> L.A. Slasher. This sounds really interesting. It's a thriller. It's about a man who is driven to rage over the excess of reality television, becomes a cultural crusader, kidnapping famous nobodies to make a point but ends up causing more tabloid frenzy. And The Overnight. This will be expanding next week week but to start out it's in these towns this played at Sundance as well to great reviews it's a sexy comedy directed by Patrick Cack Bryce starring Jason Schwarzenegger uh, Taylor Schilling and Adam Scott it's about two couples whose <laughs> children's play date turns into a couple's play date when the kids go to sleep wait a, wait a second oh, did no. you say Jason Schwarzenegger oh should I say that <laughs> that's my God. that's the best new Schwarzman. that's the best new movie, personality like, oh. who's ever been created I want to see <laughs> all of the Jason Schwarzenegger movies jet lag and spending like four days sorry to call you out on that but I mean I just I just think that's no. a wonderful idea the, like, I didn't even think about it you're Jason <laughs> Schwartzman Jason Schwartzman I also want to remind you guys that Dope and Me Earl and the Dying Girl are still playing in cinemas and you should definitely catch those two mm -hmm. and Me Earl and the Dying Girl have just has just expanded this week so you can see it in more places so Russ apart from uh, Jason <laughs> Schwartzenegger yeah. what other movies or stars are you looking forward to seeing um I mean, A, Big Game and Into the Grizzly Maze should kind of be one movie, right? <laughs> yeah. Where it's like this wilderness escaping from danger. I haven't seen Big Game yet. I've meant to see it for months now. And it's just like, it sounds like 
Escape from New York set in the woods, Sounds which so just interesting. seems awesome. ridiculous, <laughs> and I'll watch that. Um, I have seen The Overnight, and I like The Overnight a lot. Uh, the Overnight is a very sort of raunchy comedy, and it's easy to focus on that part. But the other thing about The Overnight that really worked for me personally is that the the main characters played by uh, Adam Scott and Taylor Schilling are uh, a couple who have just moved to Los Angeles and are sort of trying to find their place socially and are finding are very anxious about the idea of like where am I going to find myself? How do I establish a circle for myself? How mm-hmm. you know how do I make friends as adult as an adult? I've moved cross country to new cities twice in the past three years. And it's hard. I've done it. You You have to have like blind friend dates. Yeah, you really do. You (laughs) kind of just have to go up to people and like, hey, I want to be your friend. friend. Let's, yeah. yeah." (laughs) And it's super awkward and it's weird, especially if you're a beardo weirdo who (laughs) like doesn't like to go outside and doesn't know how to talk to people like me. And so there was a lot of stuff in the overnight that I found really, really uh, identifiable in a way. And it's not the sex stuff, it's that really basic social stuff and I think that's what helps that movie really work and then the sex stuff is fun yeah but it's that underpinning of kind of a really basic life anxiety that is like oh, I, I see what you're doing here I meant to see the overnight at Sundance but mm. it was one of the ones I missed and I really want to see it for that reason I think it is fascinating when you're you, you have to establish new friends and when you're a weird Australian with jet lag <laughs> who <laughs> forgets things and and doesn't like to go outside either yeah. then it can be difficult but I also want to see LA slasher because because that sounds really hilarious. Um, I always get overwhelmed being here in LA with the amount of reality TV and the amount of all the, all the celebrity stuff, the celebrity culture, and I think it would be really interesting to have a premise which plays into that <laughs> and also makes fun of it. Yeah. What about you, David? You've seen Dope and you loved it? I love Dope uh, and I'm saying, telling everybody to go see it. I know it's, it's kind of out here now, but it's, it's expanding and how you connected with Overnight mm-hmm. is how I felt about Dope. Sure. Now, I didn't grow up in the inner city, but I did grow up in an environment where it'd be a high school, about a thousand kids, there'd be maybe two African Americans Mm. and I was into comic books I was into Star Wars (laughs) and even by my white friends they would say like oh well you're not really black or you know you're into white stuff when you first watch the movie it's like you know these kids are into white stuff and they name what white stuff means you know manga and all that kind of (laughs) stuff so I've always felt like that so I thought it was cool to see these inner city kids living in Inglewood have to express themselves their 90s hip hop culture and their you know stuff they like all like they love Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones and I like all that stuff too so I could really identify with dope because I haven't I don't think I've ever seen a movie. It was a coming of. It was super bad, mm. but an African American version of super yeah. bad. I don't think I've ever seen that before. It felt a little bit John Hughes as yeah, well. It was, yeah, yeah, coming of age yeah. and just uh, knowing who you are. I, I loved. It. I thought it was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. incredible. Shamik Moore, who stars Dope, is fantastic. Yeah. Like he's mm. so yes. good. The whole cast is really yeah. good. Asap Rocky is kind of awesome mm. as the you know the main gangster dude. And yeah, there's some great stuff in there. I yeah. liked. I liked Dope a lot. I mm. can't wait to see Dope and Me on the Dying Girl again. <laughs> For a second time, because I loved it. Mm-hmm. All right, on to our short film competition. And the winner this week is, drum roll, Wishful Thinking by Max Hall. Yay! Yay. <laughs> this is a comedy about two guys who have a genie at their disposal, but they don't make the best use of their wishes. So congratulations, Max. You have movie tickets coming <laughs> your way. It's a great show. David, yeah. I thought this movie was actually quite clever and cute. What did you think? I thought, I thought it was very cute. I mean, I love the girl's costume. The mom comes in right there. Um, <laughs> I guess you should never share a genie note to self mm-hmm. always have the genie for yourself get <laughs> yeah. your three wishes and get out uh this film shows off what happens when you have to share that or at least share ideas with your friend it just doesn't usually work out too mm-hmm. well yeah. and russ for some young kids making this movie i thought they did really well with yeah. no budget at all yeah and it's you know one of the one of the rules for kind of making a short film like that is or you know making your earliest films it's always great to figure out what you have at your disposal you know oh i've got a school or i've got this space i have my friends and whatever and then figure out how to make that work so that you're you know you're not battling all of these impossibilities along with the basic difficulties of getting a movie made Definitely. and you know i think it's really cool that these that these guys put this together and yeah. and uh, the genie's a cute idea like it's a really the way that they realized the genie is this weird sort <laughs> of like i was going back to train spotting is this like kind of raver <laughs> kid genie who yeah. doesn't really care just kind of just interested on her cell phone yeah, totally. there you go. yeah. <laughs> seen it all before <laughs> yeah exactly yeah really mm-hmm. sweet so if you guys have a short film to send in that's under 20 minutes long send it my way to amc 
Indie at gmail.com. And speaking of uh, directors making their mark, I thought for <laughs> this week for our indie picks, we would choose movies and directors who we think are on to big things because mm-hmm. we've just recently seen with Colin Trevorrow in Jurassic World mm-hmm. and with Ryan Johnson doing Star Wars, the Black Panther news with Ava DuVernay. I mean, this is where the directors get their start. So uh, we'll start with David. What's your indie pick, a film who you think the director is on to I big things? I don't want to butcher the name Rick uh Famuyiwa. <laughs> <Right>. That's awful. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. Director of Dope. Um, again, great coming of age story. I. I want him. Well, it's too late now. Now we know who's doing Spider Man. But I would love to see <laughs> him direct one of the younger characters, a coming of age character. I'd love to see him direct like a Peter Parker, mm-hmm. and to see how he could, you know, just do that from his sensibilities because he tells these great stories. Um, he's done typically African American movies. He wrote the story or had the story for The Wood, which I love. The Wood uh, back in the day when that came out. I, I can't believe he wrote that. It's been so long since that came out. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I would love to see him do like maybe uh, one of the bigger franchises, like a superhero film. I know mm-hmm. Spider Man is too late, but maybe something in the future. He, yeah. yeah, I love the the style of Dope. It's got mm-hmm. such a great energy about it, great vibe, like fantastic he can become a superhero music, easily. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think he shows a lot of promise. So hopefully mm-hmm. he gets a chance to do something big. Mm-hmm. Russ, what about yours? Well, you know, it's first. I want to preface this by saying (laughs) I like how you're grinning there because you know what I'm going to say. (laughs) I want to preface this by saying that I'm always a little wary about saying like, "Oh, I want this person to jump like from dope to doing, you know, the Spider-Man movie or something." It's Mm -hmm. or someone like Ava DuVernay, who I think is an amazing filmmaker and has a lot of really great stuff in front of her, and I'm. On one hand, I would love to see these directors do a really big movie. On the other hand, I want to see them do stuff where they have a little more control, you know, or where they're like, so like, like more Ryan style. Johnson has, has had a couple of movies where he was in this sort of middle ground where he's like not doing the tiny thing, but he's got a little bit of budget and a yep. place to play. And it's like, I think it's great for filmmakers to build themselves like that and to develop who they are, develop their voice. And it's great for audiences too, because it gives us weirder, different Mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. That said, Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed Cop Car at Sundance. And Mm -hmm. so when John Watts was selected to direct Mm -hmm. Spider-Man, announced yesterday, I was kind of like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And I got, I I get that, you know, and he's a guy who's been around, like he's done uh, comedy for The Onion. You know, he's got this kind of varied, a little bit weird resume. So he's not like this super new director. He's just a guy who most people didn't know. But Cop Car is, um, you know, it's Cop Car is a movie where uh, two kids are wandering in the woods and they, or they're just kind of wandering out behind their house and they find a cop car that seems to be abandoned or it's a sheriff's cruiser really. And they, one thing leads to another and soon they're joyriding in this cruiser. And it turns out that uh, the sheriff played by Kevin Bacon wants his cruiser back and mm-hmm. maybe has some other stuff going on. And, and so it's like, it's, it's got a, there's almost a Coen brothers esque simplicity to cop car, you know, like it's all about this tension and, and there are places where John Watts does a really, really good job with it. You know, he's, he does great stuff with the kids. It's funny. And then there's stuff at the end of cop car that's so intense and that is just like terrifying to watch because you're putting kids together with guns and it's in a way that's like, Again, very real world and very plausible seeming, and it's horrifying, especially given all the stuff that we've seen with, you know, gun violence lately. And so this is a movie that works, Cop Car, that works as kind of this almost uh, smart, exploitative thriller. Uh, And so I'm very curious to see what he's going to do when he Mm. bounces up and suddenly has this kind of... Sony slash Marvel resources at his disposal. Yeah, and I because sometimes I, they can do these big films and keep their style. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I and think that works. Mark Webb did that to a certain extent, but uh, it oh, seems you know, yeah. like it seems like Sony was very heavy-handed with trying to guide or you know push those Spider-Man movies in a certain way. But there were places where you could see. Mark Webb kind of glowing through, and I liked those places. Though. Yeah, Garfield and uh, Emma Stone's chemistry was just perfect. I yeah, mean, all those scenes I, I loved about Amazing Spider Man 2. I didn't enjoy the movie as a whole, but whenever they were together on screen, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. And so I'm hoping that, that John Watts gets l- just enough leeway that he's able to still be who he wants to be. Mm-hmm. 
but can also kind of have some fun with the characters and the property and the fact that, you know, suddenly he's able to make a movie with a dude <laughs> swinging on webs, you know. <laughs> uh, it is always an interesting thing when the directors go to these big movies, how much say they get to have and how mm-hmm. much they have to be forced into making a big franchise. But a director that I'd like to see have more opportunity because I think he's got a lot of potential is John McLean and he directed mm-hmm. Slow West. Mm-hmm. So this was his first feature film. He's done a lot of short films before, but this was his first one writer and director and it's really impressive it shows that he has such a fantastic eye for cinematography and pacing as well it's it's beautifully shot it's very elegant it's a western it's got tension and pretty much two-hander throughout with Cody Smith McPhee and Michael Fassbender and it's got some romance in there as well keeps you on enthralled the whole time so I can't wait to see what he does next because mm-hmm. I think that he is set for big things and he could definitely do more if he had more budget and bigger cast and mm-hmm. I think he'd be great. Have you guys seen Slow West? Slow. It's yeah. come up like on my instant uh, I don't know if it's an Amazon it. Prime or Netflix I need to watch that. You yeah. should watch it. Watch it's it. awesome. Slow West is really good. It's I keep saying uh, that Slow West is kind of like um, Slow West is to the Western what Hannah is to the espionage thriller in that mm-hmm. it's kind of in the way that Hannah is is a thriller, but it's also kind of a fairy tale. And it's this mm. sort of um, colorful uh, uh, way of approaching all of the conventions mm-hmm. of an espionage thriller. And Slow West is very much the same for the Western. Like mm-hmm. it exaggerates things it's a little bit. It's got a very color, uh, colorful kind of like eye popping aspect to it. It's very funny, very blackly funny <laughs> yeah. in places like Ben Mendelsohn ben is Mendelsohn. terrific. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But it also has this real biblical underpinning and it's very smartly written, I think. And so it's a movie that, that works I think for a, I, I hope that more people see it because I think Slowest is a movie that could work for a lot of different audiences. You know, if you want kind of a funny, weird Western, it's that, but it's also got some real depth to it. It's got great acting. And yeah, I, ho- I hope people like really start to discover Slow West. Yeah. I think I'd off tonight, so I yeah, think I might be it. watching that. Watch <laughs> it. Let me know what you it. think. Definitely. Yeah. Wow. yeah, I was really, really I love impressed. Ben Mendelsohn. He's probably one of my favorite character he's, actors. And he's always right good now. when he's a villain. Yeah. He's got those sparkly mm-hmm. eyes. He's always crazy. He's always crazy. crazy. Always crazy. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. crazy in this too. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get on to Mailbag. If you have an indie movie question, you can send it our way to <laughs> amciindie at gmail.com. That is exactly what Kellen Abner did. He wrote, hey guys, what are some of your favorite child performances from indies? My personal choice is Quivenjane Wallace in Beasts of the Southern Wild. Thanks, guys. Keep up the great work. Well, Cody Smith McPhee, who I just mentioned, I think he's older now, but he's been consistently great. The Road, I remember seeing him and Mm. just fantastic. Also, Australian film called Romulus, My Father, when he was like that tiny. (laughs) Um, Also love uh, Ty Sheridan in Mud. And Abigail Breslin in Little Miss Sunshine. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? What are some child performances you like? Uh, I'll I'll go, please. Okay, I'll go. Uh, (laughs) The one that I always... Yeah, no, it's okay. (laughs) The one I go back to all the time, (laughs) and I'm going to totally mess up her name, so I'm really, really sorry, um, is uh, Kintika Untaru, who was in The Fall, which is Tarsan Singh's movie from the mid-aughts. And she's... uh, she's just amazing in this movie and it's so it's basically a film where uh lee pace is a guy who uh is kind of a movie stuntman who's in the hospital he's had an injury kind of there are complications there but he's in the hospital and she is also in the hospital there and they kind of develop this sort of friendship and he basically spins this wild yarn to her she comes and kind of hangs out with him and he tells her stories Um, And so it's this movie that is grounded with these hospital scenes between the two of them. And then there's this really fantastic sort of story world that is visualized in Tarsem's very, you know, very uh, grandiose and colorful uh, style. The movie is gorgeous, but she is what makes this movie work. And she's phenomenal in it. She's just really terrific. I don't know. She's been in maybe like one or two other kind of shorter little things. She's not someone who made a career as an actor, really. But I mean, if if I would think that any actor would look at her work in the fall and think like, if I could do something that's as good as that, like 
cool. I'm done. I'm good. I got this. Yeah, she should she should be in more stuff. I can't yeah. I can't think of what else she's been in, but, but yeah. the fall was brilliant. What about you, David? I'm gonna go a little bit old school. Uh Jody Foster, taxi oh, driver. Yeah. You know, and I think so she's good. twelve. Mm-hmm. Would yeah. you forget? I mean, especially with the clothes she was wearing, you forget she was that young. Um I think she's incredible now. I've always liked mm-hmm. Jodie Foster. I wish yeah. she again another uh, actor, I'd love to see do more work. I think mm-hmm. she, she's great. Uh, also, I know this isn't doing indie. I know this is more of a studio, but uh, Judy Garland at 16 years <laughs> old. I know it wasn't of a studio, but I mean, still, uh, Judy impressive. Garland. I th- she's. I just watched it recently. I got the the Blu-ray, the mm-hmm. 3D, and she's just she's fascinating. I, I just love her on screen. She seems so much older than she is, and she just lights everything up. Not not just because of the color. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think she's fantastic in that role. Nellie mm-hmm. Portman, professional, yeah, is another sure. one mm-hmm. that's yeah. always great. Um, yeah, if, if you want to link to Jodie Foster, you can go to uh, David Fincher's Panic Room. Also. Not an indie, but Panic Room has Kristen Stewart, Kristen Stewart, very young Kristen Stewart, in a role that I think a lot of people forget that that was Kristen Stewart. Mm-hmm. And you go back, she's terrific in that movie. She's really, really great. And that also serves as a great segue to the next mailbag question from Ladin <laughs> Kulik, who wrote, Hello, AMCI, I love the show, We're keeping it always red hot and furious. Yeah, that's right. My question is, do you know when Taylor Lautner's indie drama Run the Tide is coming out? I want to see him acting in a movie that's not an action film or the Twilight Saga. Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart have both proved themselves through indies, so why not give Taylor a shot? Thanks. So I tried to look up about Run the Tide and I couldn't find any information about an exact release date. It always just says 2015. Have you heard anything differently? I haven't. No, I haven't. And I think, uh, you know, I think Taylor kind of got stuck in this zone where he was very much known for Twilight. He was this, this, you know, there was the whole kind of recasting drama that Mm -hmm. he was caught up in early in that series. And he's that guy who never, so far anyway, hasn't really managed to distinguish himself outside of that series and whether that's... Do you think he has it in him as as an actor? I'm not a fan personally, yeah. but I mean, I want to see everybody succeed. You know, I'm not wishing for the kid to fail at all. Kid, he's a guy, he's an adult. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's doing okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, yeah, I would, I would be very happy to see a movie that where he impresses me. You know, I haven't seen it yet, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have it in him. Yeah. What about yeah, you, David? Same with me. Think? Uh, I wasn't sold on Robert Pattinson until I saw Rover. Oh, yeah. And then I was like, okay, because he wasn't being the pretty boy. He wasn't, I mean, I guess he could have been maybe the hero, but not really. He was kind of just like, you know, he's playing something lesser than he normally is. He's not tall and upright and looking, you know, pretty like he always does. And, you know, Harry Potter, such a digger, he was he was good in that. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I'm right now with Lautner. I'm not a fan. I, I need to see something. And maybe this will do it. I just, I think some people have it. Ezra Miller, for The Flash, has it. You can see that. Even, oh, yeah. uh, even in any trailer you watch with him, you know that guy can act. Yeah. You know, I think, I don't know, Lautner, maybe he needs, I don't know, maybe he doesn't have that. We'll it's see. so hard for these kids in Twilight because I feel like, as we were saying, Kristen mm-hmm. Stewart was in Panic Room, mm-hmm. Into the Wild. Mm-hmm. I mean, she'd done quite a bit of stuff. And then because of Twilight, it's just still getting people go, oh, I don't know if she's that great. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, actually, she's better than I mm-hmm. thought she would be. And it's like it's hard for them to shake that franchise off. Taylor, yeah, I haven't seen anything that proves him yet, but that doesn't mean he can't do it. And I'd love to see him try something else besides taking off the shirt and being (laughs) a werewolf. (laughs) So that brings us to the end of AMCI Indie Spotlight. Make sure you share this show with all your friends because we want to see lots of people just watching this and supporting (laughs) indie films. I'd like to thank the two Beardo Weirdos for helping me get through this episode today. (laughs) Russ Fisher, Fishy Fisher. (laughs) <laughs> it's better than Rusty, honestly. Where can people find you online? <laughs> uh, I'm at slashfilm.com every day, and I'm on Twitter as uh, Russ Fisher, all one word, R U S S F I S C H E R. Don't call him Rusty. And David Gryffindor, where can people find you? You can find me uh, on Twitter as well at GriffinDE. I'm also on YouTube at Think Hero Pro, and you can find some of my writings uh, on screenrant.com. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thank you can you. find me at Alicia Malone on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or in bed because I'm so tired right now. (laughs) Go out and go see some indie movies and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.